Okay. Back with Andrews and Wilson, as I was joking a minute ago, it kind of feels like it's our quarterly meeting with you guys. Um, <laughs> we've, we've chatted so often. You guys have such a busy book schedule that it seems like we always have a reason to, to come together and catch up. And I, I was running over what all has happened since we've talked in April. And I just want to run through the list with you real quick. It's not all inclusive, but it's it's an insane amount of news. Um, since Four Minutes was released in April, you guys released Active Defiance. We had the uh, U.S. primaries, the conventions, uh, the debates, which saw, you know, presidential candidates step down. Then you guys released Ember. We had a crazy election season to include uh, a candidate being shot at, which was insane. I don't think we've ever seen something like that in our lifetimes. Um, Jeff, you released Julian's numbers in October. Congrats on that. Thank you. We had the presidential election, and then, you know, President Putin comes out and says, I'm looking forward to talking to President Trump and a peace agreement. And then he promptly uh, shoots an ICBM at Ukraine. <laughs> right? Like, how can you do that in the same week, man? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it gets even crazier because then South Korea, I don't know if you guys have seen this lately, but South Korea and the martial law thing. Insane. Crazy, right? Yeah. It's a great time to be a writer. There's plenty of uh, plenty, plenty of news. Of and that's just and then the BRICS currency was threatened. It looks like that's picking up steam. That threatens the US dollar. That's kind of a big deal. Supposedly a Chinese ship cut an underwater link to some of our NATO allies. That's kind of a big deal. And then this week you guys released defense protocol, but also a health insurance CEO was assassinated in Manhattan. Did you see that? Yep. Yeah. What kind of worlds are we living in, guys? A world rich for fodder for thriller writers. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's a reflection of, of the, the crazy culture that we live in. Um, there's so much division, not, you know, America used to be the leader. Um, and we, and by that, and I still think we're the greatest country on earth, but I don't just mean we led economically and we led politically. We were sort of the role model, right? We were the adult in the room. Mm -hmm. And now you see this incredible, angry, vitriolic division in the United States. And I would argue that it should be no surprise to anyone that that then expands out beyond our borders and into the entire world. And uh, so if you want to have the responsibility of being the grown up in the room, then you need to find a way to be on the same page. And, you know, I, Brian and I talk about this all the time. We don't agree on 100% of things politically. Who does 100%? Yeah, but we're yeah. best friends. Yeah. And we, we get into debates and sometimes we get, you know, fired up. And then we go and have a beer and laugh and talk about our kids. And so when we abandon that, when, when people with different views became the enemy in our country, then I think that it was inevitable that that would spread like wildfire across the globe. And I, I truly think that that's what you're seeing right now. I think that's a great point. That's a, I don't think if people have not thought about it like that, I think they should because, you know, when you're trying to be a role model and a good example, every move of yours is, is watched and people will react accordingly, you know, from professional athletes to our politicians. And I think that is, that is definitely something that's gone around the world. And now you, you, I didn't see the South Korea thing happening. I didn't see it coming. I don't no, think that anybody that did. A little out. <laughs> that, I, that caught me off guard as well. Yeah. Um, I, I knew that he was the South Korean president was having problems getting some of his policies in place, but it, declaring martial law like that was kind of a was out of left field and um, very, mm -hmm. very I didn't see that coming. I saw something going on with China and Taiwan before I saw anything else coming, which you guys excellently wrote about in defense protocol. I have to say you guys wrote active defiance. I thought, whew, this was amazing. How are they going to follow up? <laughs> Golly, I, I, I can't tell you guys enough like how impressed I am with Active Defiance and then what you did with Defense Protocol, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody, um, but wow. Like, as Thanks, I was reading like it, <laughs> yeah, as I was reading it, I was looking at my wife, and I'm like, I swear to God, these guys are predicting the future. If it <laughs> happens, th these guys, you guys are going to get knocks on your door. <laughs> if, if it happens like it was it's such a great book like how did you guys sit down and come together with a plot line 
so reminiscent of classic Clancy, but for today, that felt so real. I think what's nice is that this crazy world does give us lots of fodder for the books. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, when we were thinking about our second book in the series, we had to, I mean, we weren't going to do another submarine book. Uh, we definitely felt like, you know, you look back at, okay, you had Hunt and then you have Red Storm Rising, which is a big Navy book, you know, sort of looking at potential World War Three with the entire uh, Russian Navy fleet, Russian Air Force, U.S. going toe to toe. We, we weren't prepared to do something that big. But we did want to expand to, okay, let's look at what does our Blue Water Navy do over in the, in the uh, you know, Southeast Asia theater and, and what's going on over there. Right. The Chinese have been telegraphing the reunification of Taiwan for two decades now. You know, it's, it's not something that they try to hide. They've said this for years that, you know, Ta it's one nation, Taiwan is part of China. Reunification is inevitable. It's not, a, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. That's all out there. It's easier said than done, right? Yes. Uh, Taiwan is the world's semiconductor manufacturing epicenter. 90% uh, I think of the world's semiconductors, complex semiconductors are made there. So there would be massive geopolitical ramifications uh, for Taiwan to be absorbed. And uh, it's just something I think that would give even people in the Chinese hierarchy, political hierarchy, pause. So we, because of the complexity and the seriousness of it and all the posturing involved, we thought, okay, this is a great next stage for our next book. And that's why, and that's how we dove in. Yeah. Jeff, what do you think about the whole semiconductor thing and it being kind of a pawn in this whole situation? Yeah. I mean, not even a pawn so much as just another layer of complexity, right? The, the days where, you know, a country wants to occupy a landmass and that's their goal. And they, if they, they either do it and there's a cost in, in blood and treasure or they don't, and then they either win or lose, those days are gone. We're, we're a global economy. We're a global culture now in many ways. I mean, yes, there's divisions within that. And so it's not just a question uh, like Brian was hinting at. It's not just a question of militarily. Could they do it? Uh, the answer is is overwhelmingly yes. I mean, I'm not saying that America wouldn't step up and and intervene. Right. But it would li they're literally minutes. Taiwan is minutes militarily. When you look at aircraft and missiles and fast boats, they're minutes from mainland China. Um, and so could they take Taiwan, yes. Um, would we intervene? I hope so, and probably. But why don't they? It's not because of the strike group that's out there. It's because of the cost to them economically and geopolitically. Um, the, the cost in severed alliances, the cost in real money. If America were to stand up and all of our partners in Europe and say no and enforce an embargo or tariffs or whatever, it would truly devastate the Chinese economy. And so that's the real risk now. It's not just a risk of money. And so I think that that is, that is the semiconductor issue is a layer of complexity that is part of all of that, right? And so I think that was what was fun about this book was, you know, we didn't just say what would happen if we would had to look at how could they do it in a way, what kind of false flag operation could they do that would allow them to overcome those other geopolitical hurdles. And that was super fun and super real world and required us to do a, a kind of a deep dive into the economics of it, the technology mm -hmm. of it, all of yeah. that. Um, and it really made it very, very exciting. So I was looking on Google Maps this morning because I want to put it in a perspective to people that maybe don't know or haven't looked at a map recently from the islands that you guys talk about in the book by there by Taiwan to China is only 105 miles. Mm -hmm. The Strait of Taiwan at its narrowest is 83 miles. The state of Connecticut is 89 miles wide. And that's a little state. That's a little state. <laughs> it's a very little state. So the proximity, as you, you know, said, Jeff, the proximity is not 
in question on whether China could. You know, they could launch missiles and attack, and it would be very hard to respond, even though we have a strike group out there that could. The action could pop off very, very fast. It goes to the back to the debate on why hasn't Putin just nuked Ukraine and called this a day? Well, if you want to take the land, you know, if you want to take over, why would you destroy what you're wanting to take? You know, and that's, again, the semiconductor thing, the economics of it all, you know, going, going to war with the United States is not good economically for either country. And that becomes a huge geopolitical concern, not just for the two of us. I mean, think about all the other countries that rely on us. What happens to our economies if they crumble? Right. Well, yeah, and the, think- flip, the flip side of that, Jeff, which is um, how could they get away with it? And we sort of hinted at, th- at this in the book. They have to do it in a way where many of those nations would be, in, they'd be encouraged to, to walk through willful ignorance. It's like, they probably did it, but I think there's enough ambiguity that I can pretend they didn't because I can't afford the economic cost if I'm uh, Germany or even smaller European nations. I can't afford the economic cost of severing ties with China. I can't, I can't afford it. And so they don't have to do a perfect covert operation. They just have to give it enough plausible deniability that enough partner nations would be willfully ignorant of what really went on so that they wouldn't exact that toll on them. And I think that's the interesting part, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. They got to think of something that makes it look modestly justifiable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's what we explored in the book. Sorry, Brian, I didn't mean to, to cut you off. No, I think that's, that's, that's what I was going to talk about is that exact element of that, you know, part of modern warfare, we talk a lot of, in, in all of our series, you know, the, the title of Sons of Valor 4 is Sons of Valor 4 False Flag. Um, but it's not, it's not the first book we've explored that concept in. This is, a, this is a theme that runs throughout the tier one books and, and now in Clancy too, you know. And so one of the things Jeff's talking about is this idea that, you know, there's this psyops component and messaging component and diplomatic component to conflict um and like i love what he said i love how jeff explained it's like plausible deniability you know as long as we can put the window dressing on this and get away with it we will you know i think china's been hoping for a long time that they could get taiwan to voluntarily reunify right that's why they spent so much effort trying to infiltrate their politics and with propaganda and messaging so that the taiwanese people just say yeah let's just let's just go back to the homeland, we're one China, and do it themselves. So they could avoid this possible uh, conflict and invasion. They, they don't want to do it that way. You know, what's happened in the last election is that Taiwan's in hell no. You know, they rejected the pro-China candidate and they've stayed on the, you know, separate, we're a separate nation uh, politic path. So, you know, how long that'll last, I don't know. But I, if I was China, I would be, still saying, okay, you know, the lowest cost, most palatable solution for everyone is that we somehow spin it that we get, they, they, they wanted to do this themselves. I want to segue into kind of the media, TV, Hollywood stuff. I don't want to go put you guys on the spot. Don't get yourselves in trouble of leaking anything, but <laughs> how is the development of all the different series going? Because you guys have a lot of on your plate, you know, four minutes was released this year, like instantly felt like it was, it was picked up to, to go to uh, TV series, I believe tier mm-hmm. ones in development you guys got any updates that you can reveal without getting in trouble. Yeah, a couple. I mean, um, we, if you go to the website, anybody that follows us, you can see we've got, you know, more than a dozen things in various stages, but Hollywood like publishing is a little squirrely about what they want to talk about uh, before they want to talk about it. And so we have a lot of restrictions on it. But the things we can talk about, one, as you mentioned, uh, four minutes is is uh, we've partnered with Mark Evans and he's working on bringing that to film. Um, but the big one most recently, of course, is our deal on tier one. So uh, tier one has been optioned um, by uh, the perfect partner for the project, which is uh, legendary. Uh, we've met with them several times. We love the team that we're partnered with. And we're really excited to be able to announce that um, They've attached uh, Peter Johnson and Marcus Blakely to produce uh, two amazing guys, well-versed in this genre, uh, very experienced. And also 
great human beings. Like they've, they've really become good friends and their, their vision for storytelling matches ours. We're executive producers on the projects like we are on almost all of our projects. Um, so we have a voice, but more importantly than the voice, we really feel like we have partnerships over at Legendary and, and for sure with Peter and Marcus. Uh, so we're excited about what that show is going to look like. You know, the, the, as an author, you can appreciate your biggest fear is that someone takes something that is your baby and and completely destroys it. And um, and we've all seen that happen at, mm -hmm. at various degrees. So we've been highly cautious and selective of who we partner with, especially uh, on the tier one series. And then um, we've got another thing that's set up. I get, I'm not sure. Can we talk about what we have over at Amazon? We can't, right? Not really. Hmm. Okay. okay. We have something set up at Amazon Studios we're excited about, but uh, there's a lot going on. But the, the tier one stuff is pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah. I'm pumped for that. I'm pumped for, I'm pumped for four minutes too, because I love that book so much. It's a great story. It's oh, so much fun. It's so good. Mark yeah. Evans is amazing. Like, you know, partnering with him to produce is pretty cool. So, well, I, I like that you guys have taken such a cautious approach because I think branding now is more important than it ever has been. And exactly. I think gone are the days where you could just sell the movie rights off. And then the Hollywood went and did their thing with it. Um, it's a, it's a still, it's, it's always been a reflection of the author and the publisher, et cetera, et cetera. But with the rise of social media and the, the impact and the, the kind of the presence you have to have, I think it reflects back on whether you want to or not. It reflects back onto the authors and say, I've heard people tell me like, why did, why was, why did they change? Why did Jack Carr change the terminal list series? Well, well, well Jack didn't. He, you know, or whatever it may be. Why did they mess the Clancy, you know, this last Clancy thing up? You know, well, they, they didn't. You have to understand how it kind of works. I like that you guys are being cautious and been being protective of the brand because you have a lot of devoted people when it comes to Tier 1 and especially Dempsey. Um, walking on eggshells there, if that doesn't go right, because Dempsey is such a beloved character. And uh, I'm pumped to see him come to the big screen because whoever takes that role, you know, is going to be an icon because people really love Dempsey a lot. And I'm I'm stoked for that. I, again, four minutes. I'm stoked for that. I can't wait to see what happens with that because that was a really, really good book. That's, it's very astute that you you cued into all of that, because something with the Anderson Wilson brand, I mean, we're at 10 years here partnering. We've been very intentional from the beginning that, you know, military ethos, mission before self, moral character, common sense based values. Um, these themes permeate all of our books. And um, so these were these were like the front and center discussion topics we had with Legendary before we even signed the papers, which is, you know, are you guys looking to adapt this and, you know, sort of try to remain true to these values that these characters espouse and live by? Or are you just wanting to, you know, develop something called tier one and go off in whatever direction the winds will take you? And, and uh, we had a lot of assurances from the studio that no, it's, it's the brand, it's the stories, it's Dempsey, it's everything that you guys stand for. And then, you know, our production partners, their producers, Marcus and, and Peter, they've echoed that. Now we've had a meeting with the writer and, and the writer that they've brought on board is, is also, uh, you know, he, he's like, look, I want to tell a story that's truly American. And what you guys have been able to do is tell a story that's not political. And that's very hard to do. And we've been very intentional about that. It's not, you know, when, when we served in the military, when we were both active duty, no one would ever ask you who you voted for. Right. No one would ask you, you, you know, to criticize the administration on X, Y, or Z, because that wasn't your place. You served the administration and I served over multiple administrations and so did Jeff. So it didn't matter whether there's a Democrat or Republican in office. And so we've tried to carry that ethos strongly through our, our storytelling and our series. Well, I think tier one is exactly that. Like you said, it's very, very American. It's very, uh, you know, the un, you know, very bipartisan, uh, yeah. just American story. And that's why I think people love Dempsey and the tier one stuff so much because it was just action thrills in your face. 
um, kind of like what the old action movies used to be like, you know? They didn't yeah. have a slant. It was just an action movie for no reason at all. You remember those old, <laughs> old, Schwarz, old Schwarzenegger movies? Remember Last Action Hero and, oh, yeah. and, and True Lies? It was just an action movie for no reason at all. Very little <laughs> cool political stuff behind it. You know, The Rock with Sean Connery and Nick Cage. Like, it was just a political, or not, a non-political, you know, worst case scenario, chaos kind of movie and you know tier one does that and you guys do it really really well i think that's why people like him so much because it's just in your face action because and i i mean as a guy i love that i would watch i'd watch it on repeat you know <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about branding but i want to talk to you guys a little bit more about that because you've aligned yourselves with a handful of companies not a ton but people who really align with your brand like bone frog uh, and recently, Wilson Combat can talk to me about the relationship you have with those guys. We'll start with Bone Frog first. Yeah, I think Bone Frog is the quintessential American uh, entrepreneurship story, right? So it's a veteran entrepreneurship. It's someone who served his country um, and for his second act decided to dedicate his his service of passion to a new venture. And that's, you know, coffee, which is different than, you know, uh, fast roping into the hot LZ, right? It's not the same, but he's a veteran entrepreneur, Tim Cruikshank, and, you know, a percentage of his proceeds go to uh, Navy SEAL Foundation and um, SEAL Legacy Foundation for the Sons of Valor brand coffee that we've partnered with. But I think, He's about celebrating and honoring service through business, right? And so veterans, when you separate from active duty, you've lost this entire sense of identity and community, right? You, 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 were a, you had your identification from your branch of service, your rank, your unit, your brotherhood. That's all ripped away from you. And now suddenly it's gone and you're trying to navigate the civilian world. And so what we've tried to do as two Navy guys who were entrepreneurial in the publishing business, because make no mistake, being an author is running a small business. You know, this is an entrepreneurial venture for us, but we feel like any other veteran entrepreneur who's starting a business, the most challenging aspect of getting that business off, of, off the ground is discoverability and awareness. So anything we can do to help Jeff and anything, I'm sorry, to help Tim, anything Tim can do to help us, that's just a great synergy. And it also dovetails with our mission before self mentality. So it just seems like a natural fit and the right thing to do. Yeah. It's good coffee too. I've had some guy had got the sons of valor brand. It's good stuff. Yeah. It's delicious stuff. And you know, the Wilson combat uh, is, is a very similar thing. You know, they're, they're a, a, a all American company and they partner with law enforcement and military. You know, when I was still, working in the military, there were special units that, you know, went to Wilson and had them custom make various things uh, for them. So, you know, it was another one that just felt extremely natural um, and organic. And we're just so delighted to be able to do it. We have had plenty of people approach us, you know, about partnership and uh, talking about their brands and stuff like that. And we've only done it with a few, you know, Declan James, a former team guy that makes custom watches and Bone Frog and Wilson. We partner with the people that reflect that same ethos that we have and that we try to respect in our book. So um, these have been very natural, easy things to do for us, to be honest. Well, and again, for for authors listening or you know, people who want to be an author that's listening, Listen to the lessons here by Jeff and Brian when it comes to branding and your partnerships. It's really, really easy to sit there and say yes to the first one that rolls across your plate. Um, being selective is okay too because it pays dividends in the long run. It lends credibility. You know, you partner up for the right reasons. You give back like you guys are giving back as a whole. I think that stuff's all really, really important with who you align with and, and making sure that it's not just a, a money grab. Like you said, it's it's partnering for a reason. Yeah, amen. 
Uh, Jeff, before we let you go, um, I want to hear real quick about Julian's numbers before you have to split. Um, congratulations on that, but a solo book. You guys had a bunch on your plate this year. You know, putting out Julian's numbers, how did that feel doing a solo one and kind of getting back to a little bit more of the horror, a little something different? Yeah. It felt a little, it felt simultaneously like coming home because as you mentioned, that's, that is where I sort of got my start. Um, but it also felt weird. It's, uh, I, the book I will, uh, to be upfront, um, the book was the rough draft of that book was written years ago before Andrews and Wilson sort of, uh, exploded onto the scene. Um, and it's been there in the back of my mind and, uh, and that of my agent, as you can imagine, uh, for all of that time. Um, so yeah, it was, it's kind of nostalgic for me to be back in that, uh, horror sort of supernatural thriller, uh, space. Um, but also felt a little weird to be doing something without Brian. I, if I had to choose, I would do everything else moving forward just as Andrews and Wilson, because it's just so much more enjoyable, but it's a book I'm excited about. Uh, it's a return to my roots, uh, and hopefully people will take a minute and check it out. Awesome. Well, I know we got to let you go. Uh, um, thanks for coming on. I'll continue on with Brian because I want to hear what you guys are doing in 2025. But uh, again, thanks for stopping by, Jeff. I appreciate you, man. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, man. See you guys soon. All right. See you, man. See you. All right, Brian. What's going on with you guys in 2025? You had a fantastic year of success with Four Minutes, Active Defiance, another Tier One book. You know what is going on uh, in 2025 with you guys? Yeah, great question. So I think first I want to let your listeners know and any of our readers and fans that are that are uh, watching today that, you know, we know that sometimes we make you wait <laughs> for uh, the next installment. You know, we're very blessed because we write four series, so Clancy, but in addition to that, there's Tier 1, there's Sons of Hour, there's Shepherds, and um, we've got a lot of fans who are really invested in those series those characters and we get it we love those characters too and uh there's there just happens to be two of us and a lot on the plate so thank you for your patience but the good news is we have installments in all four series coming uh, in 2025 so um first up is dark rising which is book four in the shepherd series uh jed is back um along with the rest of the shepherds and sarabeth and and uh uh, the, the Joshua Bravo team. So new adventure uh, set this time on uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, which is kind of interesting. We've never had that as a, as a, as a set piece or lo location of interest in any of our books. Um, so that one's awesome. Coming out in April. Uh, after that is going to be Sons of Valor 4 False Flag. It comes out in July. That's book four in the Sons of Valor series, picking up after uh, Sons of Valor 3, which is kind of a real uh, kick in the nuts uh, story mm -hmm. uh, where we ended up that ended that first trilogy um, with um, Al Qaeda and, and, and uh, Kasim Nadar. So that trilogy came to end. This is the sort of launching off what happens next with Sons of the Sons of Valor team, Gold Squadron chunk and watts and then uh next will be tier one book nine it picks up a couple weeks after ember which is our last uh which is the most recent tier one book that came out over the summer and then in december we have the, the next clancy book uh still untitled but um uh we're working on that one right now so that comes out in next december awesome is there yeah. any is there any news on another four minutes book, a sequel to that or anything? Yeah, we want to write uh, the sequel. It was always intended to be a two or three book series. Um, where there was a huge cliffhanger in the end of four minutes, as you know, Jeff, because you read that. Um, I think, you know, strategically, we're trying not to jump the gun on this one because, you know, it is in development for film right now. And um we're hoping to attach us to screenwriters we have a screenplay a rough draft of the screen screenplay that's an adaptation of the book but i mean we're still at early enough stages that you know if if the film goes a, a different direction we'd like there to be a nice synergy between the book uh and the film so i think as long as we have a seat at that table, we don't have to be the screenwriters. Uh, hopefully we are, we're lucky enough to be the screenwriters and hopefully we're lucky enough that it gets made. 
Um, but I think it w would make sense to try to have some consistency speaking simply to what you were saying. You know, the audience, they just don't like it. You know, it's just not satisfying when you go into a film or TV series expecting one thing and you feel like there was a bait and switch, right? Yeah. So Mark Evans is such a smart storyteller. Mark uh, is the producer who's d done um, The Old Guard. Have you seen that on Netflix with Charlie Theron? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, so it's so well done. Old Guard 2 is... Um, has been shot and they're in editorial right now. Oh, really? And then, um, yeah. So, I mean, we're really hoping that, you know, he's so good at storytelling, so good at recognizing what works and what doesn't that, you know, we could have that. We're hoping that for a similar experience on four minutes. Oh, well, if it meets the same tone as the old guard, then wow. Yeah. I'm already... I'm already over the moon, but man, that's <laughs> gonna yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be good. It's gonna be fantastic. How do you guys juggle your schedule? Because between being deeply involved in all of your media projects, you know, and, and writing the books that are are not only having success in the you know literary lanes, but are getting such a you know attention from Hollywood. How do you two juggle your schedules and do all this? Yeah, I think when you first start, uh, you know, writing, at least back when we started, like 2015, there was this sort of mentality that, you know, you can write one book a year and, and that's that's what the expectation is, you know. And um, I think that, you know, one book a year, I think that, that our society and our readers they, they just are hungry for content and, and people get impatient, you know? And, and so one book a year is, is not the gold standard anymore. And, and we decided, you know, through, through our, own, you know, some, some, some maybe happened by accident, some, you know, is just good luck, but, you know, we started pitching different series and, and opportunities came to us. And so what happened is instead of saying, no, we, we, we can only do one look, one book a year, we challenged ourselves to say, well, how can we spin off, you know, Chunk and give him his own series? Do we have the bandwidth for that? Okay, well, you know, Tyndale approached us. Can you do men's Christian fiction? You know, a, a men's, you know, covert operations series with a faith element. Are you guys up to that challenge? Yes. Okay, we'll take that challenge on. Tom Colgan comes. Can you guys fit in Clancy? So, oh my gosh, how can we say no to Clancy? So then what happens is it's like you look at your calendar and you say, well, Either we have to say no or stop writing one of these books, one of these series, or we just have to up our game, you know? And what we used to do, what we used to give ourselves six months for, we can give ourselves four months. And what we used to give ourselves four months to do, we give ourselves three months. And I think we've hit, you know, the limit of our scheduling and productivity capabilities at four series. That's really difficult to, you know, deliver a high quality product because we don't want the quality to suffer. And also, you know, when we started, there was no such thing as AI. Um, but now we got to compete against AI too. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but we don't use AI to write our books. You know, our books have always been written by just the two of us. It's a, co it's a collaboration. It's a partnership, but you know, it's human stories written by humans who have done, been there, done that. So we have no plans to incorporate AI just to increase our productivity or anything like that. So, you know, hopefully what the way we man, so I guess that's a long winded way of getting back to your original question, which is number one, we've challenged ourselves to do more, you know, in less time. And that means instead of writing, you know, two pages a day, we're going to challenge ourselves to write five, six, eight pages a day, both of us. Right. So that means sometimes we work, at night. Sometimes we have to work at the weekend, you know, sometimes we, we don't take holidays off. I mean, I mean, veterans day, I worked, you know, I worked 10 hours on veterans day. It's just, yeah. it's just part of that, you know, what yeah, it means yeah. to have a small business. You work yeah. your ass off, right? Oh yeah. There's no, there's no set hours. There's no seven thirty yeah. to four thirty. There's no nine to five. Like you work when the opportunity gives you time to work because you know, like now, like I, between working full time, running the podcast, the blog and writing my own projects, you know, I work when I have 
time to work. I don't yeah. sit down and do. You're working have, 60 to 80 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. I have those earmarked times to sit down and just do mindlessly nothing. Like I still play video games for like an hour or two a week just because it's that time to mindlessly do something enjoyable for no reason at all because it gives yep. me that break because I need it because I have edison, you know, episodes to edit. I have social media stuff to publish and push out. And if I had all the money in the world, I'd hire out people to do some of this stuff for me because it would be a godsend, but I don't. And I just have to, you just got to work. I, I think that's part of the hustle of being a small business owner. And it's essentially what exactly. we all are as, yeah. as authors is it's, it's much more than just writing a book and handing it over to a publisher now. Like it's because that's not, yeah. That, and I think that that's an important comment that you made is there's this misconception among aspiring authors that you get to be Hemingway and you sit in your office and you write your book, you take as long as you want, and then you deliver it. And then the publisher will suddenly make it an amazing bestseller. And then you just work on your second book. And that's just not the truth. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the business side of the job and the, and, and quite frankly, the more successful you get, the more, uh, time requirements there are on all these other components, you know, the interviews, the social media, the mar marketing, the travel, and then the, you know, the project. So, you know, the Hollywood stuff sounds really sexy and it's great, um, but it's a huge time suck, you know, and it's another, it's a whole nother thing that we didn't have to worry about in the early days of writing tier one, which is now, you know, we're on conference calls, several conference calls a week, maybe a conference call a day, plus emails, just making sure that we're part of the process and as more projects move you know from option to development that's more and more time you know so we'll see we'll see our goal is to to make sure we're always delivering a high quality product you know when the wheels fall off the bus we never want to turn in a stinker we never want to phone it in right so if we feel like we're at the point where we're at a breaking point or where something has to give then what happens is there's a break. And so in the case of the Shepherd series, there's been like a two and a half year break. And, um, you know, like I said at the beginning, we're just grateful for our fans that they understand that, you know what? They had an opportunity to write Clancy. And so Shepherds had to go on the back burner for a little while because we didn't want to turn in the bad book. So we're going to honor the characters, honor the series, but we got to do it right. And, and so sometimes there might be a delay on one or more of the series. And I think it then goes to the kind of the debate of is more equal less or does less equal more? And yeah. how do you balance that out of you guys could have forced through another Shepherd's book and said, hey, you guys got what you want. Enjoy. And, yeah. You know, and, and people might have felt like you mailed it in. Instead, it was like the break was OK. And I yeah. think that that is maybe hard to do in publishing just because they they if the momentum's going, they want to book a year. You know, yes. fresh ideas, you know, the market's changing, you know, what are you offering to keep you relevant? You know, what does your brand do? And it's something yeah. me and Ryan Steck have been talking about a lot lately is branding and, and talking about projects and, and being creative outside the manuscript pages, because it yeah. really means something for you to be more than just a guy behind the keyboard. It means a lot to the fans and to your audience that you are giving back to the community that you're involved in things that they're interested in too. And it's, um, it's a, it's a big, big deal. And then juggling a schedule like that and becoming, again, we've said it already a million times. You're mm -hmm. a small business owner. You have to protect yeah. the brand, the name, everything. There's no building that you put the name on, but you're protecting it for sure. And I think you and Ryan are both great examples of that, right? That you've you. built, you know, other channels for access to readers and to engage with readers and to support the other members of the community. I mean, I think back to with Ryan, he was one of, you know, nobody knew who we were mm -hmm. and he didn't have to read tier one and review it and put it on his website. He hasn't had, he hasn't had to be an advocate. He didn't have to be an advocate for us over all these years, but he has been, you know, and, and he did that all for free. I mean, we don't, pay to have our books read or featured on the real book spy nobody does right like he's done this because he loves the genre and he's built an incredible business mm -hmm. and um that's paying it forward it, it really is and a lot of us owe him and and all podcasters and all folks like yourself who have us on we owe you a debt of gratitude and we're very grateful for the opportunity
Oh, no, I'm I'm grateful to get to know you guys and to get and to get the books and get to read them ahead of time. Like, you know, just telling people like, yep, I got the new Clancy book. And they're like, when does it come out? I'm like, well, not for another month and a half. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's just that's awesome as it is as, as a fan, you know, and yeah. as someone who enjoys it. You getting to get your hands on it early and enjoy it and then getting to turn around and hype it up and say, you guys are going to love this. Here's why. Um for me, it's fun whether I get to publish anything in fiction or not ever, you know, just doing what I'm doing now is worth the labor, you know, of love because it's, it's just enjoyable to be part of the community. And cause I think community is everything. Totally. Yeah. Well, Brian, I've had you for a while now. I appreciate you. I love defense protocol. I can't wait to see what happens in 2025 with all the series. I know you guys are working away. Um, you know, keep it up. Love you guys. Appreciate you coming on every time you're willing to give some time. And, uh, man, I, I wish you guys the best luck in 2025. I know we'll connect again, but I have to say it. Thanks so much, Jeff. And, hey, guess what? You'll get advanced copies of all the good stuff for 2025. Look at that. Look at that. Thank you. you too, man. <laughs>